You will hear a mother, Shirley, talking to Kate, an admissions officer at a school. First, you'll have some time to look at questions one to three. You will see there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. You must be Shirley Peters. My name's Kate. Yes, hello. I'm Shirley Peters. Nice to meet you. You have a 10 o'clock appointment with us? That's right. I'm supposed to go to the admissions office. Is that here? Mrs Peters has a 10 a.m. appointment, so you choose B... 10 a.m. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. You must be Shirley Peters. My name's Kate. Yes, hello. I'm Shirley Peters. Nice to meet you. You have a 10 o'clock appointment with us. That's right. I'm supposed to go to the admissions office. Is that here? Yes, it is. Please take a seat as I have several forms for you to fill in to enable you to enrol your son at this school. We have a form for your name, address and so on, one for the health of your son and one for him to choose extra subjects to join in. Thank you. Now, firstly, this form is just so we have a record of your son's personal details. Can you fill it in for me? Yes, I'll do that now. Can I just check the details with you? Your son's first name is John. No, that's his middle name after his father, Richard John. My son's name is Colwyn. Can you please spell it C-O-L-W-I-N, not C-O-L-W-Y-N, as some people do? Yes, I'll make a note of that. And how old is Colwyn? I've put down that he's entering year six, so therefore he's 11 years old, turning 12 this year. So at the moment, he's 11? Yes, correct. You now have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now answer questions 4 to 10. Let's move on to your address. Do you live at 7 Watley Crescent, Mount Lawley? Yes, that's right. The street is spelt W-H-A-T-L-E-Y Crescent in Mount Lawley. Yes, I can see you've written that. Which phone number is best to contact you on? Well, I'm out and about doing things during the day, so probably my mobile rather than the home number. So that's 041332588. Yes, 041332588. Secondly, can you complete this form regarding your son's health? Yes, I'll do it for you now. Thank you. Now, can I go through the more important areas of this form with you to make sure our information is accurate? Yes, of course. Is your son taking any medication at the moment that the teachers will need to be aware of? Yes, he has asthma, so he will be carrying his puffer in his school bag. So he has a puffer. Is he allergic to anything? Yes, peanuts. Actually, he should avoid all types of nuts. That's OK, because we have a policy of not having any nuts in our school. Is there anything else that you think we should be aware of? As I've written down, he also wears glasses, which he needs to keep on all the time. I'll highlight that section on the form so his teacher will know about his glasses. Finally, this school has a wide range of interesting subjects that your son can participate in. Could you mark on this form what your son would like to do? Yes, certainly. Here you are. Firstly, it seems your son is particularly interested in football, so I'll make a note of that. Secondly, with regard to music, would you like him to start learning the piano in music class? Yes, that would be fantastic. Now, turning to art, I'll let his art teacher know that he likes drawing cartoons. Wonderful. Finally, let's look at languages now. Did you know that Mandarin was actually only started at the school this year? Really? 
Well, I think Chinese would be the most useful, even though my son's friends have already been learning Indonesian and Italian. Well, now we have all the information we require about your son. We hope he enjoys himself at our school. I'm sure he will. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Turn to section two. Section two. You are going to hear a talk by a tour guide about the local history of Harbour Town. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the historic downtown area of Harbour Town. I'm going to give a presentation on the history of the area before I let you all go. There's great weather today, so I'll try to keep this short. So, from this room, you can see most all of the historic area. This intersection is where the city was first founded about three hundred fifty years ago. The San Gabriel River is wide and deep, and it was an excellent waterway for the movement of goods. Harbour Town used to produce lots of beef and oranges. Before the city grew, there was lots of open land for grazing and planting fruit trees. They traded these products with other towns and cities. The weather in this region is excellent for growing oranges because there are warm summers and mild winters. Citrus fruits can't survive in places where there is severe frost. At the height of citrus cultivation, there were over 500 orchards growing citrus fruit. Unfortunately, this fertile land also had lots of oil underneath it. In the rest of the country, new technology required the energy found in fossil fuels. After the first oil wells were tapped, agriculture gradually gave way to industry. The farms. Orchards and ranches that surrounded the town were replaced by new factories, cities, and roads. There is very little agriculture in the region these days, and certainly no cattle. The oil eventually ran out, of course, but other industries such as aerospace and entertainment were established. Well, that's a brief history of Harbour Town. You can use one of the computer terminals available in the main office if you want more information. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. I will highlight some of the sites here just to give you an idea of what we have in the historic center of Harbour Town. You can then explore the area as you please. So I've already mentioned the intersection where the city was first founded. The main east-west street is called Sunset Road, and the main north-south street is called Santa Monica Avenue. The central office we are in right now is at the northernmost end of Santa Monica Avenue. There are public restrooms here, as well as computer terminals that connect to the internet. Across from the central office is the fruit market. At its height, people from all over the country came to buy fruit from the distributors there. 
If you travel south from the market and go past the intersection, you will see the ranch museum. Here you can learn about the old ranching lifestyle that was such a hallmark of our region. Now, going back to the intersection, if you go west of Santa Monica Avenue, you will find Old City Hall. It is an excellent example of the architecture of the time. In the opposite direction, going east of the main intersection, you can see Sunny Movie Studios. They don't make movies there now, of course, but it was the first company to make movies in our region. Also, the subway station is accessible from all four corners of the intersection. If you didn't take the bus here today, I am sure that is where you came from. Well, thanks again, and I hope you enjoy your visit to the historic area of Harbortown. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear two students, Dylan and Emily, discussing the techniques they use when listening to lectures. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi Emily, what did you think of that lecture? A bit hard to follow, but I have some good lecture listening note taking strategies which really help, so I can review the lecturer's message later. Lecture listening note taking strategies? Review it later? That sounds interesting. I must admit, I struggle a bit to take down the gist of what I hear. Look at my notes. Well, I can see a basic problem immediately. You're writing full words, such as century, when all you need is a C. And don't write increase, just draw an up arrow. And why write thousand when a TH will do? I see. Just use symbols. That's not a bad idea at all. It's the most basic strategy, allowing you to record information at a faster pace. These lecturers can talk faster than others, too, so you don't want to waste any time. But you need to be very familiar with your set of symbols. Why? Because you'll have to look at these notes days, weeks or even months afterwards when you begin writing your essay. So you'll need to be able to interpret them at a later stage. I think I can do this. Even by looking at your notes. Imed must mean immediately. But regarding the lecture as a whole, I knew the professor would be giving a set of specific recommendations and comparing two alternative approaches, so I formatted my page in advance, adding the features consistent with the nature of what I was going to hear. Uh, I think I need an example of what you mean. Well, look at my page. Before the lecture, I drew large headings saying recommendations. You should always draw these, and I drew a table saying approach one and approach two. At the end, I drew a flowchart, as obviously the final recommendation would be a step-by-step -step approach. Then I was prepared in advance to simply fill in the spaces. Wow! Now that's clever. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Your advice about note-taking sounds great, but I still have one question, Emily. How are you able to design your page in advance? I mean, how can you predict the nature of the talk and know which design is likely to work best? It's rather obvious when you think about it. What's your next lecture about? Legal studies. Well... That suggests to me that you'll need a flowchart, since the judicial system has a very logical do this first, do that second approach, which must be followed in that order. You know, all the processes that happen in the courtroom and the procedures that must take place to ensure complete legality. Sure, that's the way law is, very linear and orderly. But what about culture studies? 
That's just a mass of comparisons of different cultures. Which tells you that you'll need a table where, in tabular form, you can efficiently write down information. But often the lecture's not that simple. The professor throws in a really complex mix of ideas. Then use a spider graph, like the web a spider makes, where there's a central idea around which you attach all the associated thoughts and ideas and impressions. I see. I think I understand. And that would be very quick too, very efficient. I like that. But what about management theory? How would you approach that? The same as with culture studies. I'd use a network which is basically the same as a spider graph, linking thoughts. Although this time there are directions involved. It is this element that makes it different: the fact that the thoughts go one way and not the other. Okay, has directions. It sounds logical. And what about the other subjects, such as political science? There's no predictable order to that. Well, for that I just put my notes in a line, that is, in linear or straight line fashion, and these notes would use symbols, of course, to save time. Okay, that just leaves mass media. For that, I wouldn't have any special design at all. As you say, sometimes it's impossible to predict in what way lecturers will present their information. In which case, the best you can do is pre-write headings. But not specific, just general, as in main one, main two, sub one, two, and three, and so on. Okay. But always be prepared to adapt to the nature of the talk, using any one of the other methods if it becomes appropriate at the time. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on archaeology. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-three. Many thanks for inviting me along today to talk to you about the results of some very interesting recent archaeological research. The saying "You are what you eat" is often applied to present-day dietary advice. Certainly, our bodies will show evidence of whether we eat healthily or live on fast food and takeaways. This can be particularly useful in archaeological research. Through a careful analysis of the ancient bones of our ancestors, we can tell a great deal about their diet and the way they lived. I'd like to talk to you today about some research into the early settlers of some remote tropical islands in the Pacific. When these people travelled to these new lands three thousand years ago, they had to bring along all the resources they needed for survival. Including food, plants, and animals from their original homes. One such group were the Lapita people, who were early settlers of remote Oceania, several islands in the Pacific. When the Lapita set sail for the island Vanuatu, they brought with them domestic animals and crop plants. This allowed them to settle in an area where no humans had previously lived, and that had limited natural resources. Archaeologists have been keen to discover to what extent these settlers and their domestic animals relied on the resources they'd brought with them, compared to the native plants and animals they found on the island. Before you hear more of the talk, you have some time to look at questions thirty-four 
to 37. Now listen and answer questions 34 to 37. In order to try and understand the diet and lives of the Lapita people, archaeologists analyse the chemical composition of the bones of 50 adults excavated from the Lapita Cemetery on Ifate Island, Vanuatu. Depending on what we eat, we consume varying amounts of carbon, nitrogen and sulphur. As these chemical elements are ultimately deposited in our bones, the amounts or ratios of each one can provide a sort of dietary signature. For instance, plants incorporate nitrogen into their tissues, and as animals eat plants and other animals, nitrogen builds up in their own system. The presence of different ratios of chemical elements may show whether a human or an animal ate plants, animals or both. Carbon and sulphur ratios offer another clue to diet. Carbon ratios, for example, differ between land and water organisms, as do sulphur ratios, the values of which are much higher in aquatic organisms compared to land-based organisms. As well as examining the settlers' bones, scientists carried out a comprehensive analysis of the chemical elements found in the settlers' likely food sources. This included modern and ancient plants and animals. They found that early Lapita inhabitants of Vanuatu may have searched for food rather than relying entirely on food they'd grown themselves during the early stages of colonisation. In the longer term, they probably did grow and consume food from the resources they'd brought with them, but early on, they appear to have relied as much on a mixture of fish, marine turtles and fruit bats as well as their own domestic land animals. Before you hear more of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 38 to 39. Now listen and answer questions 38 to 39. The archaeologists believe that this analysis of diet may also provide clues to the culture of the settlers. For one thing, males had much higher nitrogen levels compared to females, which indicates greater access to meat. This difference in food consumption may support the hypothesis that Lapita societies were ranked in some way, or it may suggest dietary differences associated with the work people were involved in. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at question 40. Now listen and answer question 40. Additionally, the archaeologists analysed ancient pig and chicken bones and found that carbon levels in the settlers' domestic animals indicated that they were eating a diet mainly of plants. However, their nitrogen levels indicate that they may also have roamed freely, eating foods such as insects. This would have allowed the Lapita people to keep food resources that were in short supply for themselves, rather than feeding them to their domestic animals. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. <laughs>